All right, hopefully you've wrapped your ideas around the ideas that were introduced in the second video from chapter four, because we're going to continue to build on these here in the third videos, making them a little more complex at the end when we introduce multiple asymmetric centers. But one thing I do want to touch on briefly before we get into that, right, is why are enantiomers significant, right? All their physical properties are the same. Yeah. They only differ in 3D. All the connections are the same, right? We know that about configurational isomers. But they do have one notable difference, and that's how they interact with light, specifically plain polarized light, which is different from normal light. Right? In normal light, your light rays are oscillating in all directions. Okay? But in plain polarized light, all the light rays are just oscillating in a single direction. Right? You might have heard of polarized sunglasses. It's the same sort of idea. Right? And if I have an achiral molecule, it doesn't do anything to plane polarized light. Right? Achiral compound just passes through, and the plane of the polarized light has not been altered because it was an achiral molecule. But if I have a chiral molecule, right, any molecule that's chiral will rotate plane polarized light. Okay? And one of the two enantiomers rotates it clockwise, and the other enantiomer rotates it counterclockwise. Okay? And we can note that by plus, right? That means it rotates clockwise, and minus means it rotates counterclockwise. And the two enantiomers will rotate it the same amount, right? To the same degree clockwise and the same degree counterclockwise for the enantiomers themselves. Okay. And if it does that, if we have an asymmetric center and rook chiral, right, we also describe those molecules as being optically active. Okay. But if they're achiral, they don't meet those criteria, they're optically inactive. Okay. But if it's chiral, the direction that it rotates plane polarized light has to be determined experimentally. Okay. Because as you see here on the top of slide 49, right, some R enantiomers are plus, right? That means they're dextrorotatory, they rotate clockwise. Other ones are level rotatory, which means they rotate counterclockwise. Okay? Other S are plus, other are minus. And there's no way to tell. It has to be determined experimentally, so that's nothing that you would be tested on. Don't stress about that. Just be aware that the phenomena exists. Okay? How they rotate plane polarized light is measured experimentally using a polarimeter, right? And the degree of rotation will vary with the wavelength of light that's being used, right? You need a monochromatic source of light. Usually you're using a sodium arc lamp. So a typical experiment is done with a wavelength of 589 nanometers, though there are other applications that exist. The concentration of your chiral molecule, your optically active compound, is also significant, as is the temperature. That all gets factored into a calculation that's shown down here on the bottom. All right, you've got alpha, that's your degree of rotation. L down here is your length in centimeters, that's at the tube right here. C is your concentration in grams per milliliter. All right? And that, right, then hits an analyzer, that gives you your readout. This is not a calculation I will expect you to do in this course, just something that it's you know, on your radar that it exists, a polarimeter. And that's what you use to use to measure optical activity. And then this is what the readout would look at, look like, right? One is R, goes clockwise, plus 5.75, that's called the observed rotation. Right? And then the opposite enantiomer is the exact reading, but negative. Okay. And again, depends on the temperature, the concentration, the tube length, right, and the wavelength being used. Notice the temperature notation there. What if you have a mix, though? These, this is assuming you have pure R or pure S. But a mixture of the enantiomers, you can imagine, is pretty common. And that is known as a racemic mixture. That is a key idea to make sure you have in your notes, a racemic mixture. And that is a equal parts mixture of the two enantiomers, R and S, plus and minus. Okay? And because you have an equal mixture, right, 
half of it's rotating it one way, the other half's rotating it the other way. So the net is that it cancels out. The two enantiomers cancel one another out. So a racemic mixture, even though it contains optically active compounds, is itself optically inactive. Okay. And we signify that by a plus minus. That specifies we have a racemic mixture specifically, 50-50 okay. mixture. But if it's not 50-50, Right. You have what's known as an enantiomeric excess. Okay. And this is kind of a weird notation to get used to. Okay. If something is 100% R or 100% S, okay, then that's known as being enantiomerically pure. Okay. And that's a pure compound, pure redox. A racemic mixture has an observed rotation of zero. But using a polarimeter, Right? We can look at an observed specific rotation and compare it to the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, right? if it were enantiomerically pure. Multiply it by 100 to get a percent. And that will tell you right, a readout, how much you have. So an enantiomeric excess is the readout here. In the example that's given, right? it's 40% S. But if it's 40% S, right, that's the 40% relative to the peer, so 60% R. Easy calculation, not something that's going to be common in this course, right? but you may see it on a standardized test later on. So that's polarimeter and antimeric excess. The key thing to take from there is the term racemic mixture. I do want you to know that. Okay. But what about multiple asymmetric centers? That's what we're going to finish this video with. I have compounds with two asymmetric centers. And if I have more asymmetric centers, I have more stereoisomers. And the maximum number of stereoisomers that a compound can have is 2 to the n, where n is the number of asymmetric centers. So in the previous video, we were just looking at one asymmetric center, right? 2 to the 1 is 2, so there were two enantiomers. Yep. But here, with two asymmetric centers, two carbons that are bonded to four different groups, right? two to the two, two squared is four stereoisomers. Yep. And those four stereoisomers consist of two individual pairs of enantiomers. Yep. So there's a pair over here, one and two, and there's a pair over here, three and four. The relationship among the four Right, they're all the same stereoisomer of 3-chloro-2-butanol, and they're two pairs of two enantiomers, the erythro enantiomers and the threo enantiomers. And the erythro is where the hydrogens are on the same side. Okay, that's why these are called erythro, hydrogens on the same side, and the threo has the hydrogens on opposite sides. You can kind of think about it as going through the molecule, hydrogens are on opposite sides. Okay. But notice for each of those sets, of enantiomers, right, they are mirror images. So you've got right, sets of enantiomers. So four stereoisomers, two pairs of enantiomers. So the natural question is, what's the relationship between one and three and four, or two and three and four, right? Because they're not enantiomers. So what are they? And those are called diastereomers. Okay, diastereomers. Those are stereoisomers that aren't enantiomers. Okay? So they're not the same molecule, but they're also not mirror images. Because if they were mirror images, they'd be enantiomers. So stereoisomers that aren't enantiomers. And that's significant because they have different physical and chemical properties. And that might seem tricky to try and keep track of if we're not assigning R or S to the asymmetric centers. Okay? Because the easy thing to do, right, is if you have one compound that's got two R asymmetric centers, right, then its enantiomer has two S asymmetric centers because it's a mirror image. Right? But what you've done to get a diastereomer is you've taken one of the stereo centers and flipped it. So if RR is your compound, a diastereomer would be RS or SR. One asymmetric center is configured the same, and the other one has flipped. Yes. 
so we've already talked about this information with the perspective formulas, right? Fisher projections, the horizontal bonds are coming out towards you. That's the bow tie that was referred to in the second video. Vertical bonds are going back. When we have stereoisomers, we're typically showing them in their eclipsed conformations. When we have two asymmetric centers, because that's the convenient way to show the Fisher projection when they're eclipsed like that, just so we can have them going in a straight line. Okay. But keeping in mind the groups can freely rotate about the carbon carbon bond. So the eclipse conformation, as we know from the first video, or even chapter three, is unstable. The perspective formula for these multiple asymmetric centers are preferred because they show the more stable staggered conformation. Yep. So this shows how things are staggered. I will argue against the textbook, though. It's easier to determine things if R or S in the Fisher projections. It can be a little more challenging for students to assign R or S in the perspective formula. It's not impossible, right? You still need your hydrogen to go in the dash position if you keep clockwise as R and counterclockwise as S. But I do think there's some merit to the Fisher projections as well. Regardless, you should be able to know how to do both. Okay. But what about cyclic compounds as well in asymmetric centers there? Okay. If I have a cyclic compound, okay, looking specifically here at cis 1 bromo 2 methyl cyclopentane and trans 1 bromo 2 methyl cyclopentane, okay, these are two sets of enantiomers, okay, asymmetric centers here and here, right, at the carbon attached to bromine and to the methyl group, right, so two asymmetric centers there, so four possible stereoisomers, two sets of enantiomers. And that's easier to determine because the cis is a set of enantiomers and the trans is a set of enantiomers. Okay? And that's easier because it's cyclic, so it has the restricted rotation. But you have to make sure in your cyclic compound you do, in fact, have four different groups. Okay? And in this situation, I do have asymmetric centers. So that with two asymmetric centers, I get four stereoisomers, okay? But that's because, right, if I take this one here, for example, I have a hydrogen that's not shown, so that's group one, a methyl, that's group two, and then as I go around the molecule, there is a difference, right? This is a CH2, this is a CH2, but this is a CHBr versus this is a CH2. So going left and going right is dif different. Okay, so four different groups. That's why I have an asymmetric center. The opposite of that, right, look at this right here. One bromo three methyl cycle butane. Okay. This is not an asymmetric center because it's got the hydrogen that's not shown, that's group one. It's got the bromine, that's group two. Right? But as I go one way around the, the cyclic structure or the other way, I meet on the opposite side of the cycloalkane before I get a difference, right? Going counterclockwise here, that's a CH2, and then I'm over here. Then there's a CH2, and I'm back to the methyl group. There's no difference going around the ring. There's never anything that's different. So that's not an asymmetric center. So I still have two stereoisomers here, cis and trans, because of the restricted rotation about the ring, but there's no chirality to worry about here. No uh, enantiomers, because there's no asymmetric centers. The groups are the same, so it's achiral. Same thing right here, right? Take my methyl group, for example. Hydrogen is group one, methyl is group two, but going counterclockwise or clockwise, I get to the same point before I encounter a difference. So the two groups are the same, cis and trans. So the big takeaway from this third video is what we finished with here. Identifying asymmetric centers in cyclic compounds, uh, and then for multiple asymmetric centers, knowing what the term diastereomer means, knowing how to identify the pair of enantiomers, and then knowing in the Fisher projections, the erythro and the 3 O compounds. Um, wouldn't worry as much from this video about the polarimeter information. Just know the term uh, enantiomeric excess and racemic mixture.